SMP TV near Paul Adum Ochi and the icing on the cake and the Abba regarding the ambulance saga. One name I will be at in this whole conversation a Justice Johnny Kolendi Emmanuel. Now, your bonny dino, you said anti Ro and Casa will play in this ongoing case. And you may Paul Adam Ochre, a student journalist, or do you do you more, Eddie Dinkomo, Eddie Ababi Tuja, and Commodino, Quina, Johnny Colendi, and who a bon mo, a court any day. I think so he's gone on to explain a year, Troa, Sammy Jane from Babo, and TBD, said Nana Tony Jimmy, through. Say obey deposit to an affidavit into our principal state attorney B. Any deposit ye. And on a Paul Adamoch say, Sammy Jenfi is a novice. Unim hui The reason why the attorney general did that now was to unsmart them. Na said the ya oral argument in the Drew Honoma on no one casabit in your sorry. Now a church in Simo a disproval trial, Richard Jacqua, a D. You know, I feel so the trial judge, Yamami Justice Efias Awasaributri. Sa case ya ababe to nenemi Paul Adomochi has gone deep into the archives e bin si da in Ghana's legal history say trial bi be ba say na accused person aba say your man is trial in Ghana simo he goes on to say say this is going to be a novel judgment ah o din sembi bi na tuja yentie Paul Adomochi which is expert analysis and opinions okay so uh these are the key protagonists. So let's let's read. It says, after the allegation by Richard Jackpa, the third accused, that the Attorney General had attempted to coerce him to bear false witness against Atoforsen in the ongoing ambulance trial, lawyers for both Atoforsen and Richard Jackpa have brought an application before the court, Justice Ifia Sewa Bochi, to strike out the case on grounds of misconduct by the Attorney General. They come under the inherent jurisdiction of the court. Okay. Uh, these are the lawyers who have brought the case, uh, Abdul Basit and Tadiosori and the, another lawyer. So Tadiosori leads uh, Abdul Basit, uh, whom I knew from the University of Ghana. I think it was a T or something like that when I was there. Nice guy. Uh, and then uh, and Tadiosori is seasoned and then, and then uh, another lawyer. Okay. Uh, what do they want? That's a question we ask. That a mistrial be ordered. They are asking the court uh, that the court should say that this was a mistrial. That the case be dismissed. These are the two things that uh, they want. Now, what is their basis for making the argument? Their basis are as follows. One, they argue that public confidence in the judiciary will be eroded if the judge doesn't rule in their favor. They argue also that the attorney general violated his discretionary powers in violation of Article 23 and 295 of the Constitution. The matter has been adjourned to 6th June for ruling. So these are the main points they make. They say that uh, because of some conversation that occurred between the Attorney General and Richard Dakpa, which Richard Dakpa recorded or has now admitted that he recorded, which he handed over to a political party, National Democratic Congress, uh, to be applied in a press conference and to ask for the resignation of the Attorney General. That tape contains information which uh, will su suggest that if the judiciary don't check something, public confidence will be eroded. That's what they say. And then they argue also that Attorney General has uh, failed in living up to the standards of Article 295 of the Constitution. What is in 295 of the Constitution? 295 is regulating the application and the use of discretionary authority granted under the 1992 Constitution. So Article 295 says that if you, are, um, if you have a, a discretionary authority to render under the Constitution, you have to render it fairly and etc cetera, etc cetera, and you don't have to be capricious about it so they are arguing that in the attorney general exercising his discretion under the powers granted him in article 88 he has violated uh, the provisions of 295 i'm not so sure if when people violate the provisions of 295 or there's an allegation uh, about the violation of 295 that people go to a high court and say therefore i shouldn't be prosecuted i'm not so sure about that but the judge says they'll give a ruling on 6th of june so this is the main matter if you have any questions you can send it to your uh, our facebook page good evening Ghana official and we can deal with it right now uh, because i don't want to, to say too much so i just keep it to the main points and then if you have questions we can express ourselves on it what's the attorney general's response by the way so the attorney general quickly and promptly responded and then we'll come to some of the arguments that occurred in courts today so hear me out one, the Attorney General said that 
as follows. The AG argues that the application is a ruse and a desperate smokescreen set by the applicant to abort his legitimate prosecution for the role he played in causing colossal financial loss to the state in the purchase of ordinary vans purporting to be ambulances. Two, the application hinges on lies and a manipulation of facts that seeks to clothe the applicant with immunity from prosecution and to therefore and so, therefore, is incompetent and offensive to Ghanaian law. Three, the Attorney General says uh, that there is no evidence of the allegations by Richard Jackpa. Okay, Richard Jackpa makes allegations that Attorney General has been coming to him at dawn and odd hours to say something. The Attorney General says he provides no evidence of that, as far as he's concerned. Now, he also says that the application is based on lies, a manipulation of facts, and these things seek to clothe the applicant with a certain kind of uh, immunity. The Attorney General is arguing that you are being prosecuted for a matter. And then you say that because of a conversation that occurred between two people, both of whom are principal actors in the matter, I shouldn't be prosecuted anymore. That's not how it works. If you are being prosecuted for A, they will prosecute you for A, and then they can deal with what has happened in another manner. So, for instance, if they say that the Attorney General has violated their discretion, yeah, they, they, they can deal with that. They can look at it and say, yes, the Attorney General has violated the discretion. He shouldn't have done so and so. Is that the reason why the question about how much loss has been occasioned to the state should not be answered? That's the point the Attorney General is raising. That they are saying that you have occasioned loss to the state. You have to answer that question and face it fully and squarely and uh, either have an acquittal or whatever happens. But you don't say that because the Attorney General spoke to Richard Jackpa about this, I shouldn't be prosecuted anymore. It's a mistrial. We should stop. No, because Article 88, and I should have asked for it. If you can quickly get me Article 88. Article 88 is a constitutional provision which is entrenched. And it gives the Attorney General the authority to prosecute. Can a court legislate or pass a ruling to say that while the Attorney General has power to prosecute, we, the court, are telling him that he cannot prosecute. Really? I'm not so sure about that. Maybe they can say this person or that person, but the Attorney General's office will continue to prosecute a matter that they have started to prosecute. The only end to the prosecution or the, the remedy for the, the, um, the accused person is that the court will pass a verdict of acquittal and discharge. That's the, that's the remedy for the accused person. There, there, there will be no other remedy except that which is provided in the procedural law, one of it being a submission of no case. So the, the accused person has remedies. One of them is that he can file for a submission of no case at the end of the prosecution's case, and then he can go off if the court agrees with him. The other remedy is that at the end of the trial, he will defend himself so well that the court will pronounce him acquitted and discharged. But no, that's not what Case Law 214 and Richard Jackpa want. That's not what they want. They want the court to say that because the Attorney General has had a conversation or some conversation or some, some matter in the Supreme Court judge's house and etc., that they should be prosecuted no further. How does the conversation in the Supreme Court judge's house affect the matters in court for which the court has made a determination that Kessel are to force the minority leader and Richard Jackpa both have a case to answer? How does that affect it? How does the conversation on Sunday or Saturday or Monday or Tuesday in the Supreme Court judge's house affect the fact that the court has made a determination that case Lato Forsen and Richard Jackpa have a case to answer. I'm not sure how that. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how that. But anyway, on Thursday, we're going to hear the ruling of the judge because we are not the judges. Uh, she will make a determination. But something interesting happened in court today. Before I go to the photographs, and please get the photographs ready for me. Before I go to the photographs, something interesting happened in court. Let me go back to the uh, original photographs. Aha. Uh, uh -huh. Maybe should I use this one or should I use the other one? Maybe this is better. So, lawyers for Richard Jackpa, today, the only argument that was permitted. Okay, so I didn't quite finish the story. So, when everybody went to court today, they had also uh, the lawyers for Jackpa also, I think it was lawyers for Atufosun, rather. They had a tape, some tape, that they brought to court. And they were hoping that um, in making their oral arguments, they will be allowed to play the tape so that the courts may hear it. The tape then will, will evidence the points that Jackpa made. We suspect that it's the same tape that Asidun Katia played. That is the same tape that he had. However, her, her lordship burst all of us our bubble when she said that. Anyway, I'm not going to hear uh, arguments over this matter. And that's 
clearly part of the procedure. Any judge can do that. It's part of the procedure. There's nothing, no problem with it. And lawyers are very familiar with that, with the judge saying that I'm not going to hear arguments. I have your affidavit in front of me. I'll read it and I'll make my ruling. That's what she said. She opted for that angle. We don't know why, but she's entitled to do so. So that's what happened. So, well, I mean, those of us who went to the court, we are journalists. We are looking for a story. We really didn't get the story we were looking for. We all went out and we were doing, oh, this madam to Abba, etc. Anyway, so she didn't hear arguments. However, she had a f- one line of arguments because uh, Tadiosori here, Tadiosori here, had raised and uh, had raised issues against the deposition of the Attorney General. The deposition is the document that Attorney General wrote uh, in response to it that I, the Attorney General, I'm so so and so and so and so. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. He has told me something I verily believe him to be true, etc., etc. Tadiosori said that there are paragraphs of the deposition in there that um, the person who deposed to these facts cannot, should not be allowed to depose to the facts. Now, he sounded quite intelligent when he was speaking, isn't it? So he said that the chief state attorney should not be the one to depose the facts for the attorney general. He should not be the one to attend. He should write it himself. And this evening on radio, uh, uh, they had been saying that the attorney general was running away. And that is why he got somebody else to do it. Was he running away? He was in court himself. He stood there. He granted interviews that we'll show to you. He was there. He was right there in court. How was he running away? Anyway, the reason why, and, and, and some lawyers know this because it's part of the procedure. The reason why the attorney general got somebody to depose to it, we have found out from his people, is very simple, apparently. It's because he was unaware that the judge will say, I don't want oral arguments. So he was prepared to make the oral arguments himself. In that circumstance, he didn't want to be the same person deposing uh, 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 to the affidavit. Because if he did, perhaps he may not be able to make the argument. So he wanted somebody else to do it so that he will stand on his feet and deliver the arguments himself. This is the simple reason. And I don't know whether they don't know that this is part of the procedure, that the the deposition has to be done in a certain way that allows you to speak. And the the way to do the deposition that allows you to speak is that you ought not to depose to it yourself. I I don't know whether they don't know this. Everybody knows it. Everybody should know it. So this is the reason, viewers, forget about everything you heard. And they are on Facebook and they do. (laughs) Attorney General is running away. He's running away from what? The guy was in court. He was standing there. He was prepared to deliver the argument. And the ladyship said that I don't want arguments today. I will look at it and I'll rule on Thursday. So, what is running away? So, please tell them, please tell them that the reason why the Attorney General did that was because he wanted to speak himself. He didn't want somebody to speak for him. He wanted to speak himself. And that's why he did that. Anyway, during the argument, Tadio Sorry here raised that point that... uh, the person who deposited to the thing is not the same person. He doesn't have the information within his... The person doesn't have the information. However, if you look at the deposition, and we can show it, in paragraph one, the person says that all the things that he's deposing to have come to his knowledge by reason of the job that he does as a state attorney. The matters have come to his knowledge. So the matters are within his knowledge. But well, Tadio Sorry said, and the attorney general was able to argue and oppose that. No, no, the guy says the things are within his knowledge. Then the attorney general says, says something else. In bringing up this objection, Tadiosori, his lordship, relied on uh, CI-47. It's a, it's, a, it's a law called CI-47. It encapsulates the civil procedure rules. So quickly, an objection was raised in court again by the attorney general. What is he talking about? This is a criminal trial, which has its own rules. The Criminal Offenses Act in 29 and the Criminal Procedure Act in 30 are there to govern the criminal law and the criminal procedure. Fundamentally that. There is something else that governs civil law. So what is criminal? Criminal is a police matter, a prosecution. That's criminal. Civil is me and you. We are fighting over land. Me and you are fighting over property. Me and you are fighting over car. Me and you are fighting over inheritance. Me and you are fighting over Metro TV. Uh, somebody and somebody fighting over GTV, etc., etc. That's civil. It doesn't involve prosecution. Okay. Even though we can use the English word prosecution loosely to say that a matter is being prosecuted. But when we use a technical expression prosecution, that is, means that somebody has offended the Criminal Offenses Act, and the state is prosecuting. That's what it means. So the rules that govern that are outlined in the Act 30, 
uh, and Acts 29, of course, for right now, we say as amended, because since 1960, both have been heavily amended. Act 29, Act 30, Act 29 is the Criminal Offenses Act, Act 30 is the Criminal Procedure. And so now we have Act 29 as amended. And then there's, there's the Criminal Procedure. So the Criminal Procedure governs Criminal Procedure. The Attorney General was at a loss. Why uh, his lordship had your story was citing the, uh, the, the civil procedure rules to govern criminal. So there was a bit of, you know, justly in the court. It was a very beautiful uh, scene. And you would, you would have to applaud the attorney general. I mean, his sense of sharpness, standing on his feet to raise these objections against Tadio. Sorry, it was admirable. But it's okay. So the judge listened to both of them and said that that will also form part of her ruling on uh, Thursday. So Thursday is D-Day viewers. And you know we will be there. We are, we'll be there plenty. We'll be there all over the place. And then we'll bring you what happens? If the D-Day comes, then uh, what could the judge do? What um, what could the judge do uh, on D-Day? Okay. So on D-Day, these are the options that we think are open to the judge. There could be more, but we try to get uh, some options just to put our viewers in the in, in, in a certain mind on the straight and narrow as we approach the D-Day. One, the judge could agree with Richard Jackpa and accepts to dismiss the suit and accepts dismiss the suit because of the purported misconduct of the AG. Number two, the judge could dismiss the application so that the suit takes its normal course. And number three, despite all this, the letter trial judge has the ability and chance to set precedent. Okay. So, uh, well, three is, is different from one and two. So one and two are the options. He either agrees with Jaqua or he dismisses Jaqua's application. But what is essential is that this is very novel. This application is novel. Application that says that because of the Attorney General's supposed something, something, and phone call, stop the trial. It's never happened since 1960 when the Criminal Offenses Act was written and when the British finally left and they gave us our own law and we had our own laws. No individual under prosecution has brought an application to the court suggesting that the Attorney General has done something outside the court, outside the normal matter, outside the court situation and has have had a conversation with somebody and as a result of that, please stop the prosecution so that we are not prosecuted any further. Give us an immunity. Clothe us with immunity from prosecution because the attorney general, the lead prosecutor, has gone to a Supreme Court judge's house and had a conversation. The judge is looking at a novel matter. It, there's no precedent to guide her. You know that for us, our, 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 our Anglo-Saxon common law, uh, stare diseases, which means that you have to follow the rulings of other courts historically when the matter is similar. That's the judges in the Anglo-Saxon, that is British American law. That's how they call it, the Anglo-Saxon common law. Uh, those, those countries that subscribe to that common law also subscribe to the principle of following after the rulings that have happened in a similar matter. So if in matter X in 1938, this and this happened, and the same situation is occurring again in 2024, the lawyers will draw the judge's attention to what they call legal authorities. And the legal authorities, therefore, or thereby, will be compelling on the judge, except if another lawyer or the judge himself or herself is able to distinguish the circumstances. Distinguish the circumstances means you want to show that there's some part of the current case that does not look like the old case, and therefore, we are not bound by that precedent. It's called stare decisis. That's a principle in Latin. Okay, so... The, her ladyship has a big opportunity on Thursday to set a precedent on the way in which these applications are handled because it's the first time an application is ever coming. Her ladyship, remember, is a justice of the Court of Appeal and she's sitting as an additional high court judge. So a lot is expected from her in terms of the, the legal theory and the legal philosophy. And she's going to deliver that on Thursday. We wish her the best. Uh, but this... In some PTV near